Greetings from the Petersburg Church of Christ. We thank you for allowing us into your home today, and we encourage you to open your Bible and follow along with the message that's presented today. We would also encourage you to take notes and send us any questions or comments that you have concerning today's message to the address that will be provided at the end of the lesson. We invite you to join us any opportunity that you have. We meet on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock and Sunday evenings at 6 p.m. We also have a midweek Bible study on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. We are located at 205 Russell Street, just off the south side of the Petersburg Square. The Old Testament is the perfect place to begin preaching Christ. He's revealed all over the Bible. Notice this very interesting Old Testament story this morning. Beginning at verse 10 of Genesis 28. And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night. Because the sun was set and he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed and behold a ladder set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father, and the God of Isaac, the land whereon thou liest. To thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south, and in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid, and said, How dreadful is this place! This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that city was called Luz at the first. <clears throat> it was a certain place here that Jacob laid down to sleep. He took a pillar stone for a pillow for his head. This dream that he was having was none other than God speaking to him. You know back in the patriarchal age God used dreams and visions and burning bushes and talking donkeys to get a message across to people. The ladder that went from earth to heaven, what a tremendous ladder it must have been. Angels ascending and descending on that ladder. We used to sing the old song, Climbing Jacob's Ladder. What a tremendous thought. But the point I'm after in this text of scripture is that Jacob made a statement he said, surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. He also said, how dreadful, or how fearful, or reverential, or holy is this place that he found himself in. 
This place was called Bethel, according to this passage of Scripture. Our lesson this morning, what does the Bible teach about the place of God? You know, I'm afraid we haven't stopped to think about this very much. We have limited God. Somehow or another in our mad rush world in which we live, we have come to the idea that God is somewhere way off in a remote portion of the universe and he hardly even looks this way. We need to know what the Bible teaches about the place of God. Last Wednesday evening we started a series of lessons in the Wednesday night Bible study on great chapters of the Bible. In Job chapter 28 we saw that there was a place for a lot of things and Job made mention of it. Where silver was found, gold, iron, brass, water, bread, paths, sapphires, but the main point that he was teaching in Job 28, where is the place of understanding and wisdom? Where is it found? And the unalterable conclusion at the end of that chapter was that the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. A person who has no respect for God has no earthly idea of where his place is. If the only time we think of God is an hour or so on Sunday morning and that's it, we have to study the subject the place of God there's something to think about the unalterable conclusion that the conclusion of the whole matter Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 12 verse 13 is to fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole and the word duty in the text is in italics it's really an insert into the text the whole of man is what? To fear God and keep his commandments. A lot of people have no fear of God whatsoever. They do not keep his commandments. They have no idea where God is. It's just something they hear about. Once in a while they'll call on him. But they do not know where he is. Let's take a running survey of the scriptures. And see if we can't put our finger on an understanding where the place of God is. In the 26th chapter of the book of Exodus, mind you, we're in the patriarchal age. We're in the age where God was speaking to the heads of families. No written down law until Sinai. And in Exodus chapter 26, notice what it says, beginning at verse 33. And thou shalt hang up the veil under the tax, that thou mayest bring in hither within the veil the ark of the testimony. And the veil shall divide unto you between the holy place and the most holy and thou shalt put the mercy seat upon the ark of the testimony in the most holy place. Now that may be just a few words to you that you never even stopped to think about before, but dig into that just a minute. Do you realize where the place of God was as the children of Israel were wandering through the wilderness? You remember the idea that was expressed that God showed his presence with the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. 
And it was that pillar of cloud that came in between Pharaoh's approaching forces and the children of Israel as they were going through the Red Sea. God showed his presence. He placed himself with his people in the form of a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. Well, if you listen to what was read here in Exodus chapter 26, let's litigate it again. It said, And thou shalt hang up the veil under the tux, that thou mayest bring in thither within the veil the ark of the testimony. And the veil shall divide unto you between the holy place and the most holy. And thou shalt put the mercy seat upon the ark of the testimony in the most holy place. Now are these just words that was put into the text just to fill up the content of the Bible? Don't believe so. It was the veil of the temple that was torn in two when Jesus came forth from the grave. Now when you look at this and you begin thinking about what's said, where was this veil? In between the holy place and the most holy place. Is that just terminology for the fun of it? In the Old Testament tabernacle, God showed his presence into the holy place and the most holy place. And did you notice that he stuck another item in there? In verse 34 he said, And thou shalt put the mercy seat. What's that? And he put the mercy seat upon the ark of the testimony in the most holy place. What was the mercy seat? How often did the priest go in to these different parts of the tabernacle? Some places he didn't go in but once a year. Well, if he didn't go in to once a year to the most holy place, what was in that most holy place? The mercy seat. What's the mercy seat? piece of furniture? Yes. But is that what he's saying? That it's just a certain portion of the tabernacle, the holy place and the most holy place, and that the mercy seat is in the most holy place? Do you not realize that this is a beginning of a discussion in the Bible that goes from the Old Testament all the way down into the mosaical age and all the way down to the Christian age that God's telling us something what's he telling us where he is where is his place it's very interesting did you ever hear words like this Psalms 119 114 Psalms 32 verse 7 says practically the same thing what does it say it says thou art my hiding place and my shield I hope in thy word Psalms 119 verse 114 Psalms 32 says it just a little different Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with the songs of deliverance. Selah. Who is God's people's hiding place? God is. Well, what does God's people need to hide from? Their enemies? Their troubles? They gave Moses fit. I know why Moses stayed up on the mountains much. His hiding place was with God. 
And he stayed with God a whole lot of time. He found God's place and he went where he was. The Bible is telling us something here. If we'll only stop and think about it. Another interesting passage. Second Chronicles chapter 7. Now mind you, we have come from the tabernacle in the Mosaical Age. Now we are over in the Mosaical Age where God is not speaking through the heads of families now. He is speaking through Moses and the Ten Commandments, the Law of Moses. And what is it that God is having done here in Second Chronicles chapter 7, beginning at verse 11? Listen to it. Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house and all that came into Solomon's heart to make in the house of the Lord and in his own house he prosperously effected. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for an house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now mine eyes shall be open and mine ears attent unto the prayer that is made in this place. What had just happened here in this text of scripture? Solomon had finished the building of the Old Testament temple. The house had been erected. And what did God say about that Old Testament temple, the house? He said, and have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. The Old Testament temple was the place where God said he would be. In fact, he made it so specific. He said, I will hear your prayers that are made in this place. What place was he talking about? The Old Testament temple. Do you know what was placed in the Old Testament temple? In 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verses 10 and 11, it says, Take heed now, for the Lord hath chosen thee to build an house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. Then David gave to Solomon his son the pattern of the porch, of the houses thereof, and of the treasures thereof, and of the upper chambers thereof, and of the inner parlors thereof, and of the place of the mercy seat. Where's the mercy seat now? It's not in the Old Testament tabernacle. Things have gone far. Where is the mercy seat now? In the temple. In the temple. God's place of presence now is not in the tabernacle. It's in the temple. He has placed the mercy seat. What's the mercy seat for? To receive mercy. To get God's grace and his favor. To look our way, look their way in Old Testament times in a helpful manner to benefit these people. God's place. It's taught in the scriptures. Uh, let's go a little bit further. If you begin looking for God's place, you know where you'll find him? Psalm 139, beginning at verse 1. Over and over, he talks about the place of God. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting and mine uprising. 
Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Listen now. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain unto it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I send up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell or the grave, not hot hell, but grave. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, Surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day, the darkness and the light are both alike to thee. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God, how great is the sum of him. You can't read a passage of scripture like that and not recognize that there's not any place that you can go to in the depths of the sea or on the other side of the earth you cannot even go into the expanses of the universe and not know that God's everywhere. What's your concept of God? You remember what the Apostle Paul preached on Mars Hill? You recall this specific text in which he used on these Athenians? You know the Bible is right. If we believe the Bible, and we do, and we're going to preach the Bible, and we shall, notice what Paul concluded about God's place in Acts 17. Beginning at verse, 40, verse 24. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, Dwelleth not in temples made with hands. The whole thing changed now, hadn't it? It's not the Old Testament tabernacle. It's not the Old Testament temple. We're now on this side of the cross of Jesus, and he tells us that God does not dwell in temples made with hands. Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything. Seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the time before appointed and the bonds of the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord. Now listen to this. If haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live, move, and have our being. As certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is likened to gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. When you look at that passage and you let it sink in deep what he's talking about. 
Where is God? Is he necessarily in the structures that people use for their religious worship services? If God is in his holy temple, I wonder which one. Is he in them all? That's what the religious world believes. The very fact that you've got a church building erected is no sign that God's in it. In fact, if you believe what the Bible says, most religious experiences of our day and time, God's not within a hundred miles of the place. How do you know that? Because they're not doing what God said to do in it. They're not worshiping according to what God has said. Jesus told the Samaritan woman, he said, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And you get the truth out of the Bible, and you look at what's being done in the temples that are erected by men, and there's no Bible for it. There's no truth that suggests what they're doing in the name of religion there. Oh, you worship me in your way you want to. No, you can't. You remember the very first worship scene in the Bible? God had told Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, what to do in their worship. One did what God told him to do, the other one didn't. One was accepted, the other was rejected. And because of this rejecting of what one did, he became so envious of his brother that he killed him. So I'm thinking about what we're saying. It's very important that we know where God's place is. In the Old Testament tabernacle, he was in the most holy place. In the Old Testament, the tabernacle, the temple, God's mercy seat was in the temple. Oh, here's where it gets to be good. Oh, this is rich. We're not going to get through the sermon. I didn't see. We haven't even got started good. Do you know who occupies the mercy seat today? You don't. I don't. No preacher does. No local parish priest does. You get your Bible down and study it into Hebrews chapter 8, 9, and 10. You know who went into the most holy place and occupied the mercy seat none other than through the blood of God's dear son Jesus he occupies the mercy seat and he pleads our case in heaven from the mercy seat you know that leaves a whole lot of people in the world out in the cold the Muslims do not accept Jesus Christ does Muhammad occupy the mercy seat for them? No. Jesus occupies the mercy seat for his people. For those who are washed in the blood of the Lamb. And all of this is anticlimactical because we're running out of time. Get your Bible down. We'll probably pursue this a little further next Sunday. The place of God. As sure as the Bible teaches that Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief, as Paul said, and I feel the same way too, and you should too. I don't have any other way to go to the place of God than to go through his son Jesus. You know where Jesus is right now? Two significant points, and we'll quit. Jesus is at the right hand of the throne of God, occupying the mercy seat, pleading the case of his people before the very presence of God. But let me remind you of another passage. 
What did Jesus say? He said, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. What did he say? He said, I go to prepare a place for you. That where I am, you may be also. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. As sure as Jesus has a place at the right hand of the throne of God, he is preparing a place for those people who are doing his will. His children, his brothers and sisters in Christ. So if you've got the idea that God has gone off somewhere into the world and the universe and has completely forgot about man, you don't know the first thing about the Bible. If your concept of God is that you have got to be in a certain church building in order to get his presence, you don't know the first thing about the Bible. God has a place and his place is found in the teachings of this great book called the Bible. What James say? He says, draw nigh to God. He'll draw nigh to you. A lot of people don't know anything about God because they don't want anything to do with it. God's not going to come into a person's life that doesn't want him there. There's no family. There's no home. There's no business. There's no school. There is no church existing on the face of the earth that doesn't want God in. It's not going to be there. But if you want God on your terms, forget about it. He's not going to come on your terms. He's going to come on his terms. He's specified the way. That's what Jesus said later in verse 6 of John 14. They want to know the way. How shall we know the way, they said. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You're not going to come to the Father and find him unless you go through Jesus. He's the only way. Salvation is in his name, none other. Acts 4 verse 12. Let's come to grips with a world today that is so deluded and so deceived in false doctrine. They have no concept where the place of God is. May the Lord help us to understand this. Because it's going to make a difference where we have that place on the other side. He's preparing a place for us. Somebody said one time that heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. And that's exactly right. Am I preparing? Are you prepared? Does God have a place where you work? Does God have a place in your home? Does God have a place in the church where you, you tend? If he's not there, go find him where he is. If he's not in your home, he's not in your business, shake that thing down real good. Get him in there. It'll make a difference in our lives here on earth and in eternity to come. You're not a Christian. You haven't a place for God in your life. Come to grips with this. This is one of the most important challenges that will face us. I need to know where God is. And I need to find him on his terms. I need to do his will in my life. <clears throat> what John say? And hereby we do know that we know him. If we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and truth's not in him. Do you say you know God? Are you doing what he tells you to do? And you had not observed the Lord's Supper in a year. Do you hear what I say? You had not observed the Lord's Supper in a year. And you claim to have God in the religion? Wait a minute now. It's quite evident that those who keep his commandments are the ones who know him. Do you have a place for God? 
Search the scriptures. Search your heart. Let's come to grips with God's place. So we can help you in any way. Would you come to Jesus while we come? If you have questions say. or comments concerning today's lesson, you may send those to Petersburg Church of Christ, 205 Russell Street, Petersburg, Tennessee, 37144. Or you may email us at Petersburg Church of Christ at hotmail.com. You may also request a copy of today's lesson through the same method. Be sure to include today's date along with the station on which this program aired and the title of the lesson. We hope to see you again next week right here on this station at the same time.